All right, Professor Barth here. Thank you for tuning in. History of Money. We are now up to lecture 26. Believe it or not, we are you know headed you know full speed toward the uh, 20th century. Before we know it, the Federal Reserve system will will uh, will arrive. Will be upon us. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, for the next couple lectures, we're going to wrap up the late 19th century. Some big big changes coming up over the next couple lectures. For part A of today's lecture, we're going to uh, take a look at the economic setting in post-bellum America, post-Civil War America, this industrial revolution taking hold over the country. And then for part B, we're going to take a look at the national banking system, which will rule our financial system in this country from 1865 until 1913. All right, the American Civil War, obviously extremely extremely monumental event in American history. Uh, ended up solving the slave question, liberated 4 million slaves, more than 4 million slaves, but a very, very devastating conflict. Probably about 700,000 people lost their lives. The nation lost the, the, the cream of its, of its uh, young manhood. And uh, just as young, this Young generation of men, 700,000 700, of them wiped out by this war. And then many, many more than that maimed, uh, lost their limbs. Um, the psychological impact, we didn't have a name for it back then, but we, we know now as PTSD. And, and then, of course, the wounds dividing North and South after the war is over. There's a political impact um, in the Civil War. You'll recall from an, early, from, from an earlier lecture, after Andrew Jackson's administration, Democrats dominated on the national stage. Um, vast majority of Congresses were, were run by the Democrats, and Democrats occupied the White House more often than the Whig opposition. After the Civil War, Republicans absolutely, totally, utterly dominate national politics and it's going to have a big impact on national economic policy. Five of six Congresses in the decade and a half after the Civil War were Republican. There was one exception. After Panic of 1873, the Democrats won, won the House, but it was brief. Most of the time it was a Republican. There was no Democratic president at all until 1884. So Republicans control control the national government. And, and, and in fact, actually, there wasn't a Southern president in the White House until 1912, Woodrow Wilson, also a Democrat. Um, the Republican Party believed in high protective tariffs. They believed in a more centralized banking system. We'll look at that in part B of today's lecture. They believed in using federal taxpayer dollars for infrastructure projects, primarily railroads. So huge, huge grants grants and privileges given to railroad companies to build transcontinental railroads during this period. The central government became more powerful in the second half of the 19th century. The nation in general um, changed dramatically. No longer was this the, the decentralized agrarian uh, agricultural republic of the early part of the 19th century. Rather, this was a, a, a fairly centralized, strong, uh, uh, consolidated nation state. And uh, that's politically, economically as well. Major, major changes. Here's a map of the United States from 1880. Oklahoma is still called Indian Territory. 1880 map. Industrialization, industrialization. After, in the decades after 1865, America, American economic growth absolutely just takes off like a rocket. And it's led by the railroad, the railroad industry. In fact, railroads were America's first big business. America's first big business. You, you may remember this map from a previous lecture. This was the railroad system, financed in part, but in, in large measure by the free banking system prior to the Civil War. That's a lot of railroads. So, you know, railroads were around before the Civil War. But this is the railroad system by 1890. Okay, look at that rail, railway network. 
And in the green, these are rail lines that existed in 1870. And in the red, rail lines constructed after or uh, between 1870 and 1890. To construct a railroad it required immense amounts of capital, um, huge amounts of capital. It was very expensive to, to run a, a uh, railroad company. In fact, the estimates are that railroad construction costs as much as $36,000 per mile, $36,000 per mile. And this is at a time when the average income of middle-class American was about $1,000 a year. Well, massive capital, it, it required uh, 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 manufacturing and laying the rails, constructing cars, building stations, laying the telegraph lines, managing the bureaucratic structure of the railroad company. And the, and, and the railroad executives, these were heads of major business corporations, right? These aren't family-owned or individual owned businesses. These are major corporations. So this is America's first big business. Look at these numbers here. 1865, there's 35,000 miles of railway track. Now that's a lot of track. But by 1900, almost 200,000 miles. Absolutely stupendous. Lots of capital required in the construction of these railroads. The national banking system will provide that capital, as will uh, foreign investment. Um, this, in turn, promotes the steel industry. You need steel. In fact, the railroads, railroad companies were far and away the largest buyers of steel. Something like 94% of the steel manufactured in the U.S. was bought by the railroad, railroad companies. Look at these numbers. In 1870, 77 thousand tons of steel produced by 1900 over 11 million tons of steel produced and the big hot spot was in pennsylvania pittsburgh that area i actually have some ancestors who lived in western pennsylvania at the time and and worked in in uh, industries connected to the steel industry the petroleum industry took off also during this period First to produce kerosene, but then uh, other byproducts like gasoline, um, lubricants, etc. Look at the numbers here. In 1865, about a little more than 2 million barrels of oil produced. By 1900, 50 million barrels of oil produced. And then the nature of work changed. Now, most Americans are still living in rural settings. Okay, about two third by 1900, about two thirds of Americans are still living in rural settings, but about one third are living in cities, and and the the the, the size of the industrial workforce expanded quite quite dramatically. Look at this between 1860 and 1890, the difference in the number of wage laborers working in in industry. So the nature of work changes. And then look at these numbers. Um, prior to the Civil War, the U.S. was not a major manufacturing power on the world stage. In 1870, the USA had moved up quite a bit, was catching up to Britain, but still 23% of the world's manufacturing capacity behind Britain, which was at 32%. By 1910, the U.S. is number one at 35% of the world's manufacturing capacity. So what's happening here? What's causing all of this? Well, yeah, that's a, a long story. But for one thing, the population in the United States has, has soared. Uh, between 1865 and 1900, the population of the U.S. tripled due to immigration, but also due to natural increase. But also the government in the United States was, it was just a very uh, friendly, legal, and political structure for business. Um, it respected private property rights. There were very few regulations or taxes on business, which encourages investment into the country and there are protective tariffs to protect uh, American business, thus keeping foreign competition down to a minimum. And of course that, that workforce to provide the, the labor, um, abundant natural resources in the country of coal and, uh, 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 and oil Here's the, um, a 
chart a graph of tariff rates over the course of U.S. history. You'll notice they were quite high until the early 1830s, and this is when the Democrats took over. The Democrats were against a protective tariff. So under Democratic rule, the tariff went down, was cut really in third, and then once Republicans took over, Republicans supported Henry Clay's vision of the American system. Once the Republicans took over, the tariff went right back up. And then Democrats under Woodrow Wilson brought it down again, and then Republicans brought it back up in the 1920s. Republicans were always the party of tariffs. In some ways, actually, President Trump is sort of a classical Republican in that sense. Uh, Republicans late in the late 20th century adopted a more laissez-faire free trade approach, but the Republican Party historically has always been a party of protective tariffs. But anyway, that further adds a, another boost to this industrial period. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, you have these presidents during this period. Many of us are, are not very familiar with these presidents. There's Rutherford B. Hayes, Chester A. Arthur in the 1880s. Gotta love that facial hair. I, uh, you know, I could have run for political office back in those days and done okay. Uh, love that flag, by the way. Isn't that a beautiful flag? That's the American flag, I believe, in the late 1870s or early 1880s. Beautiful, beautiful flag. Um, why don't we remember these presidents? Well, they they have, were pretty weak. They were pretty weak presidents. The big the the big guys right the 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 most important men of this period are not politicians but they are business executive executives business magnates like cornelius vanderbilt cornelius vanderbilt uh was a poor boy um uh grew up on staten island started working in a in the ferry service in uh in new york harbor then got into steamboats, had some success there, and then shifted his interest to railroads. And in the 1860s and early 18, in 1870s, built an empire, a railroad empire, and just dominated the railroad industry, especially the lines between New York City and Chicago and, and places in the Midwest. Um, you had men like Andrew Carnegie, uh, the great uh, industrial magnate in the steel industry and, and Andrew Carnegie was um, born into a poor Scottish immigrant family. He actually, as a boy, he worked in a textile mill, ended up uh, uh, through hard work and, and, and good fortune, uh, making his way up to the top of the steel industry in Pennsylvania and uh, became an extraordinarily wealthy man. Also a very famous philanthropist later in life. And then the big one, uh, John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller, considered the wealthiest American of all time, maybe until Jeff Bezos. And uh, there he is. He got involved when he was um, actually grew up as a young boy in upstate New York. But when he was a teenager, he and his family moved to Cleveland, Ohio. He got involved in refining oil. Um, in the 18, late 1850s and 1860s. This um, grew into the Standard Oil Company by 1870. And in the 1870s, he bought out his competition. And as kerosene and gasoline grew in importance, Rockefeller became extraordinarily wealthy. Um, by 1879, he controlled 90% of the nation's refining capacity. Standard Oil, of course, the biggest corporation up to that point in US history, and, and Rockefeller mastered vertical integration, meaning controlling every part of, every aspect of the production of oil products, from extraction to refining to distribution, then eventually getting involved in the railroads as well, um, because of course the railroads transported his oil across the country and so he exerted enormous influence over them. Um, just enormous wealth and holding companies and trusts and, and all, all the rest. Um, Rockefeller builds an absolute empire. His wealth in today's dollars is estimated at more than $300 billion. More than $300 billion in today's, in today's uh, dollars. So, 
man, uh, that's the that's the environment. Lots and lots of changes. By the way, the, this railroad system helps unify the country and creates a national market. Okay, where where uh, the different regions are still you know sectionalism and in different regions are 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 one region is different from another. But there's now a national market, and boy, a population that's just eager to buy goods, a population that's producing. But also consuming. Look at these numbers between 1860 and 1910. Um, just spectacular growth in the U.S. population. And again, many of them are moving into cities. About a third of the population are living in cities. And six cities in the U.S. by 1900 have populations exceeding half a million people. Chicago is the big one. New York grows as well, and uh, you know the um, with all this production efficiency, um, the prices of goods went down. Consumer goods became more affordable. Actually, the standard of living for most people increased during this time period. You had access to things like the Montgomery Ward uh, catalog and later Sears Roebuck. Um, real wages increased over the 19th century. Um, but you also had a cost, right? Uh, you know, as people move into cities, the cities were often very, very crowded, tenement housing, um, you kind of spread a disease like tuberculosis and, um, and, and measles, you had gangs and street crime, um, political corruption and party bosses, oftentimes uh, tied to the Democratic Party, especially in New York. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was a free for all, okay? It was a free for all. Uh, some of the, it was an exhilarating time to be an American, but there were also some very you know dis, discomforting things about it. Um, the nature of work, yes, yeah, standard of living went up, but you're working you know 50, 60 hour weeks. Um, child labor for a while was not uncommon, uh, and you know sometimes the work could be very monotonous, not as satisfying as farm work, as Thomas Jefferson worn once worn about a hundred years earlier um and so you know these for americans this you know cause a lot of questions to be raised um is this new industrial economy is this consolidated form of industry and wealth is it compatible with american democracy is it compatible with republican government um there's more prosperity than ever but you know the nation has changed uh, the nation has changed, and and um, and many of these big corporations and and national, you know, like retailers, uh, you know, destroyed local business, and you know the old general store. Now you now you didn't go to a general store; you went to Sears Roebuck and whatever. And um, you know, a lot of big questions are are raised by this by this new reality in in the post Civil War America. So anyway, that's the setting. Part B, we're going to. Kind of go and, and look at the banking system. What does the, the banking system look like in the post-Civil War era? Tune in for Part B. See you there.